Bill, thanks so much for taking the time today. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Terrific. Well, Bill, maybe you can start off the conversation here today by telling listeners a little bit more about your background and, and your journey into working the NBA. Uh, great question. So um, I've been in the league for about 12 years. This is actually my 12th season. Um, uh, so actually, I'm going to backtrack a little bit. So I was in the military for about 13 years, Army and Air Force com combined. Uh, I deployed to Afghanistan and Iraq when it all first started. Then after the military, uh, I went to Austin Peay State University. And then from there, uh, so I did some time in college. I was an adjunct professor. Then from there, I went to the Pittsburgh Pirates. I was there for about two seasons. Then from there, I actually ended up with the Orlando Magic. I got to meet Joe Rogowski, who's a good friend of mine, uh, real smart. He's now the director of science and research for the NBA Players Association. So during my time working under Joe, I spent about two to three seasons with him. Uh, our coach at the time was Van Gundy. And then from there... I went to the New York Knicks. Um, that's where I spent my time as the head strength coach um, for two years. And then from there, I came back to Orlando for five years as a head strength conditioning coach. And just previously last year, I was consultant for the NBA Players Association. And now I'm the current head strength coach for the Minnesota Timberwolves. Amazing. I mean, what a journey. And, you know, your <laughs> training philosophy today could you tell us a little about your training philosophy today and, and perhaps how that's evolved over the years with your background, you know, between the military and, of course, all your time in the NBA? Wow. Well, I, I think one of the things I really focus on is leadership. When I first started, I just wanted to, like, know about, you know, certain exercises, how to prescribe them, why, you know, things like that, the science behind it. I really focused hard on, hard on that in order to really improve on my technical skills. But then when, as I got more involved in coaching, I uh, learned that there, it doesn't matter how much you know, it's how do you communicate that information with the athlete? Can the athlete buy into it? So I really started focusing on my leadership skills and what can I do to make myself better in order to relate well with the guys. Uh, just today we had a training session. It was fun. Guys were energetic. You know, there was a lot of music. But guess what? The effort was high. I got a lot out of them. We jumped on fourth place. We did a lot of things today. and uh, But I got the most out of them. And it was because what the energy we provided in the training session and the energy we got back, and it all derived from uh, exceptional leadership skills that I try to uh, build as I move forward along in this industry. Yeah, it's such an important piece, isn't it? That the buy-in, the relationship between coach and player, practitioner and player trainer and player and of course you talk about leadership there you know it's one of those difficult things for people to put their finger on because just as you mentioned when we're learning things it's like okay sets reps loading or if it's nutrition you know macros and calories and energy expenditure you know but then this piece this really important and fundamental piece of communicating that information as you mentioned is, is so key you know are there certain moments in your life, experiences, or people in your life that help you to develop those skills? Wow. Um, I want to say, yeah, like, I mean, there's plenty of people. Everyone, everyone in my life has played an important role in terms of me developing my leadership skill, whether it's my mother, my dad, my pastor. They all had a sense of, 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 of a servant-style leadership. Right. So doing everything and anything they can to help me achieve my goal. Right. And I feel like that's the kind of style of leadership I have in the weight room. Um, I do everything and anything I can to help the guy succeed in order to get to the level where he needs to be. And those interactions that I had at a very young age, I didn't know at the time. I think all of us go through that. I've, I kind of learned that throughout the years as I got older, what they what, what they have done for me to help me achieve my goals. Mm -hmm. And those are the same things I want to do with the guys I work with. Uh, I, have, I deal with a lot of young players. Even though it's the NBA, we still get a lot of young guys, 19, 20 years old. They're still learning. They're very talented, but they're still young. And so having a servant style leadership um, with these kind of players uh, gives them a sense of they know that I care. They know that I'm there for them. And so they, they, they're they more willing to be in the weight room more often just because they know it's an environment that will help them succeed. That's terrific. And, 
you know, I'm sure with obviously all your experience and strength coaches listening in or docs or nutritionists, there's always those those athletes, those clients that for whatever reason they're they're not showing that compliance or they're not showing that enthusiasm. Um, so for yourself over you know all the years in the league, when you do have a player that's let's say a bit challenging or not complying or not, you know, giving you everything that you can get out of them, you know, what are some of the strategies or what are the, some of the tools that maybe you've used in the past to help, you know, re-engage that, that athlete, that player, or to get them to, to really buy into what you're trying to deliver? Man, I'm trying to recall, like, if I had any really challenging moments. I, I, I could read a situation very well. Uh, I think it's because of my experience in the military. And one of the things I've learned is, is that if the situation is hostile, I don't want to add to it, right? So I'll sit back and wait a little bit until that situation is calmed down and then I approach it. So in other words, if a player is going through a tough time, I don't think I need to be the, the person to add more fire to it. You know what I mean? For and sure. so uh, what I'll sit back wait if the you know until things calm down and so then i'll come back approach him and talk to him and explain to him listen this is why we're doing it the reason why we're running today is because of this and that and i want to make sure that you're set up for success not for failure but it is in a situation where it is calm and versus you know him being upset because um you don't want that type of um, attitude when you're trying to talk to a player and so if you know how to read the situation right, you could pull him to the side, either put him in the office, bring him to the office where no one's around, and it's just you and that person, and that's how you can handle it. Because if you try to handle it in front of other people, sometimes uh, the player doesn't appreciate that, and they think that you're trying to like um, um, speak down to him in a sense versus mm-hmm. trying to speak up to him and build him up. So that's why it's important to pull him to the side, bring him to your office, really explain, talk to him in a calm manner so you can avoid those kind of conflicts. Yeah, I mean, it's a tremendous insight. And it's, it's you know, on the surface, it sounds simple, but it's, it is that, that quality, that skill of knowing when that moment's happening, when oftentimes practitioners will want to push and, and put the pedal down mm-hmm. further to get what they want. Whereas, as you mentioned, you know, being able to read that situation, being able to read the other person's emotions, you know, that idea of, of emotional intelligence and having that awareness is such a huge part of delivering that message. So that's, that's really cool to, to hear. And, and Bill, if we uh, because, shift, shift gears sorry, here a little to, bit, to, to oh, yeah, yeah, jump in. But, uh, and the other thing is you don't know what's going on with that player. So, you know, what if this player is going through something that we don't know about and that's why he's having that type of attitude. Mm-hmm. So that's why it's good to like sit back and kind of figure out what's going on first before making any assumptions. Yeah, we always talk about training load and life load and all the other stressors in life and at home and family and friends and everything else that's going on. Absolutely. I mean, those things can can take their toll and, you know, athletes are mm-hmm. people too. So that's that's great, uh, great insight there. And Bill, if we shift gears here to your, uh, you know, you recently contributed to a tremendous new book, Strength Training for Basketball by uh, Human Kinetics. Mm-hmm. You know, what was the impetus for starting that project and, and what can readers expect? So um, the the NSCA, as well as um, Human Kinetics, had approached me and Javar about putting together strength training for basketball, and they asked us for a bunch of contributors to help along with this process. So we put a a number of authors that contributed to this book as well, such as Andy Barr, Mubarak Malik from the um, Knicks, uh, Robbie Sika, Steve Smith, Bill Ferran, his son Eric Ferran. Um, you know, we had Scott, Incredible. Scott, we have a whole bunch of that are great, um, strength coaches in this industry. And they put, put this together because the idea was, was to kind of like share some updated information at all levels, whether it's college, high school, the pros, you know, what can you do to make a basketball uh, player better? And that was the whole emphasis behind the strength training for basketball was to not to keep it simple, but share the latest information that anybody could understand and use to you know, help their son or a college guy or a high school player or, or a pro player to make them better in what they do. Yeah, I mean, obviously the fundamentals are so so crucial and being an expert in the fundamentals. And, you know, if we start with young players, high school level, let's say, 
I mean, I wish I had the book like this 20 years ago when I was playing, but <laughs> nevertheless, well, you know, if we talk high school players today, you know, what are some of the common movement or, or training roadblocks that you might see in young players? Ooh, squatting. Um, they, they don't know how to squat properly. I think that's the biggest thing for me is squatting. Um, just a poor training history. They don't know how to move with the bar underneath them. They don't, um, hip hinge, um, uh, you know, poor, I think, I believe I mentioned poor core strength. Those are the kind of things I've seen um, throughout the years with young guys that come from a poor training background. And um, this book helps you um, create a good fundamental program to cover those, cover that foundation that's needed for uh, overall pure strength. Yeah, it's interesting when we get into sports that are more skill-based. I mean, if you're a football player, a rugby player, an ice hockey player, you know, lifting is sort of baked into the cake of being able to make it to an elite level. Whereas if we talk things like basketball or soccer, I mean, a lot of athletes just spend all their time playing, right? That's right. And so, I mean, they play year round. And so, they, you know, they experience the number of injuries, especially ankle injuries, where now they got limited ankle mobility, which kind of like interferes with their squatting ability. Mm-hmm. And so, um, so those are a lot of things we see. So they, it's like it's funny because they get injured first before they actually learn how to properly train. And so, so now we're trying to play. Now we're trying to like fix what they've um, uh, injured, right? And now we're trying to fix that, create this strength foundation, and really improve on that process by improving the mobility and things of that nature um, afterwards, after the fact. But I mean, it's very common, that especially guys coming from poor training backgrounds, that. They just don't know how to squat properly. I know I mentioned this already, but they just don't know how to squat properly. And, and if we can really get those basic movements, those fundamental movements with just body weight alone, then, I mean, there's there's no telling what else could be done and things that we could add to it as we move along in the strength program. And, Bill, when we talk about young athletes, I mean, early specialization, we sort of touched on it here, but obviously athletes are playing 12 months of the year, especially in sports like basketball or, you know, as you mentioned, and when you see a can of the basketball, you know, we got – Guys going professional now at 19 years old, you know, one and done. You know, what are some, in your mind, you know, what are some of the pros and cons of the early specialization in terms of athlete development? So with me, with early specialization, when it comes to certain training programs, is that what you're saying? Yeah, I suppose that whether it regards to certain programs or even as a, you know, if you were to, to have your perfect scenario for developing a basketball player, you know, this idea of early specialization, you know, is that only going to bring on benefits for their, obviously for their skill side, but is there some downfalls in terms of the, their potential to, to, to build that development over the years? I think if they initially focus on, if, if like if it was a perfect world and I had like three to four months of just a, a good strength program that we could be consistent with, uh, consistency is the key. Mm-hmm. And I think that's what lack, you know, lack, what lacks is consistency sometimes, especially early on when a basketball player comes into the league. If we could really narrow down and improve on consistency and get that going for about three to four months, and, I, and it's kind of hard to find that, but if, ideally if we could, then we could really make improvements. We could really see a guy get stronger, really see a change in his body type, and then and then introduce basketball. And I think that uh, if we could really folk, if if guys could understand that a little bit more at early on, then I could really see a difference and add more years to their playing career if they could make those changes. Yeah, it's amazing the load that's going on to a lot of these younger players by the time they make it to the pros. And if we talk about that transition now from let's say a collegiate athlete who's transitioning to the professional level, um, you know, what are the biggest areas of focus from for yourself as a strength and conditioning lead? You know, what are you trying to do to get these young athletes from college ready for the rigors of a long pro season, you know, playing against grown men? So the biggest thing for me is, is like, um, one is, it's good to try to slow the game down for them. So one of the things I like to try to include is like reactive drills. Uh, so they can see where they're going and learning how to process information. So one of the things we use is called the quick board. So the quick board basically has an, we have an iPad and it has like uh, we is a twenty double leg react. So basically, uh, it has these five dots on the iPad and whatever lights up, 
you have to touch the corresponding dot on the pad underneath your foot. And so we want to see how quickly can he respond to that information? How long, how, how long does it take for him to process it? Mm -hmm. So we feel that if it takes him a long time to process his information, even though he has quick feet, we need to improve in those psychomotor skills. I think, and I believe, especially my, my assistant strength coach and all the other strength coaches I've worked with, that if we can improve in that area, it can help slow the game down. And if we can slow the game down and he can learn more about what he has to do in the game as well, then he is less likely to be more like frantic while he's playing, like he's like spazzed out versus actually calm and collect and use and be becoming more efficient basically when he's on the floor. The more efficient you become, the more exercise economy you become as well. So that way you're you're expending less energy and using energy when it's needed. And, and it all stems from how you process the information. Because if you're like really wired and you're looking around, where do I go? How do I process this? Things like that. Then you're you're going to become fatigued a little bit faster than the other person. And and then as the season moves on, that's where the rookie wall comes in. And so I believe that's one of the things that contribute to the rookie wall. Just because a guy is so much going on, if we could slow that down by improving his psychomotor skills, I think that could help along with that process. Because uh, guys that are coming from college, especially from good programs, um, they a good strength program, especially if they've been in a year or two, they have a good solid background. Mm -hmm. And so by the time they come to the league, it's, it's not so much of a strength issue. It's more of a let's get them prepared for the NBA now. Now it's 82 games that they got to be prepared for. How do we manage that? And so we, let's start off with some reactive stuff. Let's slow it down. Let's maintain the strength and, and then go from there. Awesome, Bill. And, you know, if we talk uh, nutrition now here, you talked about the rookie wall. And then, you know, I know for all the guys, by the time you get to the three quarter point of the season, you know, down the home stretch, heading for the playoffs, guys are tired, you know, fatigue starting to set in. If we talk about things from a nutrition standpoint, for yourself, thinking back to when you entered the league to today, you know, what are some of the biggest changes that you've seen, either good or bad, that, that stand out to you? Uh, nutrition wise? I think it's gotten way better uh, throughout the years. Um, teams are actually providing more food. Uh, they're more health conscious. They're really trying. They're hiring nutritionists. Um, the majority of teams now have a nutritionist, whether it's full time, part time, or a consulting base. They they have one, and I think that's something that's totally different that's changed throughout the years. And I think it's very important because a lot of these guys need that expertise to help them either as food shopping or making the right decisions when um, when they're out there on their own, especially when we're on the road. Um, you know, we I've had guys like send pictures to our nutritionists so that way he or she knows what exactly our player is eating and kind of give them an assumption, is he eating enough calories? Because we that's the biggest thing is we want to make sure they have enough calories to withstand uh, the stresses that's being placed on their body throughout practice or competition um the other thing is you know there's more snacks they just have more resources now than in, than in the past where most teams used to never um get food and now it's, it's the, the whole get ball game has changed um you have plenty of different styles of diet whether it's paleo whatever it is um so there's a lot of educating going on to help um, guys understand what's actually required for them to have in terms of energy when it comes to playing basketball that's terrific. And, you know, for you guys at the Timberwolves, are there some fundamentals on the, you know, nutrition side, some of the big rocks why they're, that you're currently using with the T-Wolves or in your previous stops with Orlando and New York that were you know, some of the major focuses of that uh, approach? So so I, I give an example. So for me, talking to our nutritionists, we want to make sure the guys have enough calories. So... Um, but making the right choices. Mm -hmm. And so we don't want to take away, um, the, I don't want to say, we want them to have fun when they eat. We want them to enjoy the food because we feel like if they enjoy the food and it's made in a healthy way because our, our, our cooks, our chefs are great and they make it so tasteful that these guys want to eat, they enjoy it, then we know they're getting the calories in, right? And then so then we try to help them like when they're on the road, like what, what, what places they could go to. Listen, your goal is to gain weight. Your goal is to maintain. Your goal is to lose. These are your options if you go to these places. So now we're not taking away their favorite place to go. But what we're doing is 
you could go to that place, but you should have this, right? Then on top of that is we try to strategize where we're going. So if we're going at high altitude, like Denver and these other places, Utah, let's make sure we have enough carbs on the plane, right? The reason why is, for example, like when we're flying, we lose about 5 to 10% of our oxygen saturation level while we're flying. That's mm-hmm. a given, right? And on top of that, um, one gram of carb holds three grams of water. So we want to make sure the guys are hydrated because all the flying that we do, when we play in these high altitudes, there's studies that show that high altitude, you got to make sure you have, you know, stay hydrated. So I try to encourage sure. guys to eat more, more carbs on these road trips. And, and so I try to manage it. I actually, I just, um, on my uh, strength conditioning slide, because I put all, uh, my slides, all my workouts on the TV, I put a little small component, giving the guy, say, hey, listen, we're flying out to Dallas tomorrow. Let's make sure we start drinking fluids now. You know, don't wait till we get on the plane. So I try to pre-warn them. We're always monitoring and we're trying to strategize what foods to eat, when to eat. Because that's the biggest thing is nutrient timing. I think uh, every, I, I give I think everybody like is eating the right foods, but eating at the wrong time. Mm-hmm. And so um, one of the biggest things is keeping, maintaining your nitrate levels, right? So um, before a player would come in, and let's say 9 o'clock, eat breakfast. Boom, practice is at 11. So he's training, he's doing all stuff from 9, eating breakfast, treatment. Boom, practice hits at 11. Now, during practice, it's 12 o'clock. He hasn't eaten yet. So now it's been three hours since he's eaten. And so his nitrate level starts to go down. And so then what happens is, let's say practice is over at 1.30 or 2. It's been five hours since he had anything. So what we try to do is is kind of bridge that gap. So like around between like 11.30 and 12.30, we'll give them aminos. So, so that way they can have um, uh, to keep their nitrate levels up. And so we try to bridge that gap. Same thing in game time. We try to do the same thing. So we try to like give them much protein at certain times of the day based on the schedule. So that way they, they have something every, every so often. So they're not going... St- so they're not starving, and that's what I'm trying to prevent. And then, you know, of course, you and I both know, you know, if we could maintain those protein levels up, you know, you're looking at um, the, 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 the severity of the injury being way less than it could have been because the guy's stronger, he's, he's nutritionally sound, and things like that. Yeah, great point. I mean, definitely, you know, whether it's injury prevention, whether it's, you know, immunity, obviously recovery, ensuring – protein intake and as you mentioned caloric intake so important and and of course uh you know you talk about food tasting good i mean that's such a great point it sounds you know again something that people might take for granted but when you have to eat this many times in a day making the food taste good is a huge part of it and making it not seem like another to do another item on the to-do list for players i mean they have so many people talking at them and 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 instructing them that you definitely want to have those periods where they can yeah relax and unwind and yet all of those components, all those buckets are being taken care of, as you mentioned. And if we talk about enjoying food, I think we got to shift gears to the PB and J. I think peanut butter and jam sandwiches, right? <laughs> this is a staple in the NBA. You know, any favorite recipes of yours, or any? You know, are they still a go-to for players pregame? Actually, um, I want to say it, yes and no. Um, so we have it available. And so we have the uh, the bread available. Um, we have PBJs on the plane already pre-made. Um, pre-game, we have pre-game food at home. And then we we actually have pre-game food um, uh, on the road as well. And so uh, we kind of swayed away from PBJs, but it's there just in case. Nice. If that makes any good. sense. Oh, for sure. Good to have and the options. Like Don't want to have any PB&J yeah, mutinies. So, <laughs> so it's closer to the game. I I prefer a PBJ just because of the the, the uh, protein, but if it's like further away from game time, then the pregame meal is kind of like ideal. Sure. Um, but um, but yeah, so PBJ is not as often. But you know, it's interesting. The uh, I don't know. It's making me think about this, but like your line of questioning is actually right in line with everything that we're doing. So in other words, what I mean by that is, you initially asked about. Um, you know, what do we look for in a rookie, right? So mm-hmm. in terms of movement. So we, we, we want to make sure that he has a good foundation. And if not, what do we what are our strategies to help improve that, right? Number two was, you know, 
a guy comes into the league, you know, is his first time. So what are we doing? I talk about psychomotor skills, maintaining his strength levels. You know, we look at, you know, we got to figure out where he's at baseline wise, and then we improve on that or maintain it. So we use measures like force plates. We use things like fusion genetics, things like that to help um, learn what else can we find from any deficiencies from these guys and what can we do to strategize to maintain that, go- keep that going in terms of improvement. Then, uh, then you talked about nutrition. So now, now he moves, right? Now we got him moving well. So now he's expending calories. You know, he's spending energy, he's spending a lot of calories. We, we got to make sure his caloric intake is matching what he's expending. Mm-hmm. And so that's where the nutrient timing comes in, where he's make, we're making sure he eats the right foods at the right time, to, not only to fuel him, it's our fueling initiative, not only to fuel him for the activity, but to refuel him after the activity, right? And then to maintain fuel during, um, throughout the day, because on game day, there's a lot going on, shoot around, there's meetings, there's like a, a pregame um, workout, there's, um, then you got the game itself, so there's so much going on, and them talking to their family, walking around, so they're expending energy. And then lastly, um, you know, once we take all that information in, you know, we figure out, all right, this is the best thing for the athlete. This is what he's eating, what he's doing. And so now what can we – and then well, what I'll do at the end of the season, once we collect all this information and figure things out, we'll basically figure out, all right, what can we do to make this better, right? What can we add to it? You know, and that's when we start talking about adding technology and things like that. That's tremendous, and it's uh, yeah, so true in terms of timing. You know, simple sugars if they're pushed too far out in front of a game time, then all of a sudden, yeah, rebound hypoglycemia, and you got guys struggling to come out of the gates you know, on tip off or in the second half. And so, yeah, timing is is crucial in that standpoint. And Bill, I mean, we're in the we're just kicking off December here. It's uh, starting to get cold and dark and gray, and, and players are, you know, probably needing more sleep. And sometimes it can be tough with those long road trips for yourself or for the team whether we're talking recovery or maintaining immunity, are there a couple of, you know, one or two key things that you might emphasize to help keep the players, uh, you know, keep them recovering well and, and also battling off uh, cold and flu? I mean, I, I, I know I'm going to probably say what everyone else is saying, but make sure they get enough sleep. I mean, you can't negate sleep, whether it's on the plane, whether it's on a bus, um, you know, Try to get as much sleep as you can. Um, I think what happens is um, when we're on the road or, or like over like at home, you know, life gets it the best of us, and so it kind of influences uh, the way we sleep. And so, if we could really focus on getting sleep and eating the right foods at the same time, then I think you have enough energy. Um, so you don't have to really uh, rely on a lot of ergogenic aids. And I think, you know, if you could really focus on those two things, eating the right foods at the right time, including getting good sleep, I think you have enough energy to, to really do some good things. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, you know, Sheldon Cohen's uh, classic study in the 90s where they sleep deprived um, subjects and, you know, less than seven hours of sleep. And they had about a threefold increase in in infection rate and less than six hours sleep was about a four and a half fold increase in infection rate. So you so true that you got to make sure you prioritize sleep and you know for a lot of recreational athletes or even practitioners lifting listening in it's oftentimes those things that feel mundane that often go overlooked even though we hear so much about sleep now so good to hear that that's an area of focus for you guys as well and bill if we circle back here to talk about leadership you kicked off the conversation talking leadership you know i know you're doing some further you know studies and education in this area can you tell us a little bit more about you know, your area of interest when it comes to leadership? I mean, my area of interest is um, when it comes to leadership is I know I talked about servant leadership earlier. Uh, I really believe on um, listening to what the athlete needs to say. I think that's the best style of leadership is actually listening to what they need um, sincerely and being consistent with your the way you um, coach um, being um, very confident in how you speak, you know, maintain a uh, disciplined weight room. I think those are the key things for leadership. Also, you know, dress the part. Um, you got to look professional. You, you know, make sure you have a, a nice haircut, fresh haircut, look clean, because um, you really want to represent yourself well um, when it comes to leading the weight room. Um, those are my key things um, for anybody that's want to, you know, 
be a strength coach in the league or maintain a job in the league. I think if you could really focus on those key aspects on listening and actually, you know, being really professional and how in terms of your appearance, um, because you can know as much as you want, but if you if you if you don't play the part very well and you don't listen very well, I think you won't do a good job. Fantastic, and um, you know, obviously in pro sports, it's winning and losing is uh, is the ultimate needle mover. But of course, it's not really the only way that we can judge success, especially um, practitioners and, and sports med staff. So, you know, for yourself, Bill, how do you how do you would you rate success for yourself? What does it mean to you to be successful? For me to be successful, I think education is key. I think the more you know. Um, the more you're able to uh, communicate well with others. And then secondly, I think um, building relationships, uh, regardless of mm. who it is, whether it is the person that takes out the trash to the president of the company. It, I think you, if you treat everybody with respect and you build key relationships, I think uh, that's a great sign of leadership. So like really want, really mastering your craft, learning, no matter what it is, just always wanting to learn. And then two, building key relationships and treating people with respect, I think um, are signs of great leadership. It's interesting. You're, you know, it's a great, uh, great insight there as well because you know, with all the different people that I've interviewed and whether athletes and practitioners like yourself and docs in sport, this idea of relationships being such a fundamental piece of of their experience and of course how they judge their own success of the relationships they build and the lives that they've influenced. And so it's, it's interesting. Um, so keep that in the front of our minds, isn't it? When, you know, especially a lot of young practitioners as they come in and wanting to, um, you know, this is where success can mean a lot of other things. It's, it's nice to, to hear that sort of reiterated. So thank you for that. And Bill, if we round things out here, I, I want to respect your time. I know you're, you're a busy guy. For practitioners who are looking to progress their careers from, you know, maybe high school, collegiate or consultancy into working in the pros, you know, what's one tip that you might give practitioners? I mean, develop your leadership skills and create um, great relationships because you never know um, who that person may become. Um, all, all, all the opportunities I've had was, was all stem from great um, relationships that I've built throughout the year. And... Um, and then when it came for an opportunity to come by, I was I was a guy that was available. But then again, I did not neglect the fact to, that I wanted to still master my craft. And so building a relationship with someone, networking, but still learning, you never know when those two things collide when an opportunity comes comes by. And so um, that's that's the biggest thing I tell every young person, any young any strength coach when they want to get into this profession is, you know, be a good person, build a relationship. Um, and, and, and always learn. That's I don't know everything, so I, I'm still right now. <laughs> there you go. That's it, man. When uh, opportunity meets preparedness, that's when the magic happens, right? So listen, I appreciate you carving out some time here, Bill. You know, Can you tell folks where they can stay connected with you on things like social media as well as where they can pick up the uh, the book? Yeah, so um, you know, I'm on Twitter. I'm on Instagram. You know, I'm on LinkedIn. And of course, it's just my name. Bill Bill Burgos, and um, the book's actually on Amazon right now. So it's going to be worldwide. It's going to be through Barnes and Noble, but right now you can pre-order it on Amazon. And then, uh, and I'm currently working on another book and and, and a children's book too. And so okay. that's that'll be met, that'll be mentioned through my social media account when that when that time comes uh, for its release. Amazing, Bill. Well, listen, I again appreciate you coming out some time. Always great to to hear your insights and learn from your experience and definitely excited to keep up with all the cool stuff you got coming down the pipeline. So thanks again.